Welcome to week 13, and we're going to look at comets and asteroids and other smaller things that are in our solar system. Uh, right now in the sky, we have a couple of different comets that seem to be approaching us. Uh, sometimes they fragment as they get closer to the sun. We'll see why that is. Sometimes they get fragmented as they come closer to something else large like Jupiter or even the Earth. Uh, we're not in any danger from the current uh, objects of them hitting us right now, but they should put on a pretty good show as they come close to us. Uh, but that happens on a regular basis. So, so uh, here in 2020, uh, which is when I'm making this video, in case you're watching it a long time from now, uh, we have a couple of different comets that will be with us through the spring and summer and into the fall. Uh, there are, of course, other comets that come on a regular basis, uh, like Comet Panstars comes around on a regular basis. Uh, there are different ways of naming comets. We'll talk about that too. Uh, but first, we're going to start out with asteroids. I just want to remind you we're approaching the end of the term. Uh, so be thinking about your final projects and be looking for a couple of extra credit kinds of things popping up here soon in the uh, quiz area because I have a couple of extra things. If you need extra points, you can do them. They're not required, but they're available for you. Uh, so without any further ado, let me go to my sharing my screen uh, button here. And we are on comets, asteroids, the debris of the solar system. This is stuff that was basically left over from when the solar system was first formed. And comets can be quite dramatic. Uh, you see behind me one that has what I would call a sort of a variegated tail. Uh, you can see here on our uh, uh, image, Comet Hale-Bopp, which was one of the dramatic comets of the century in the 20th century, uh, showed up in, in, I think it really started being visible in 1996. Uh, but it started being visible to the naked eye a little bit after that. And you can see it has two different tails. So as we go through this, we'll see how different things are structured, because even though these are small objects, they have interesting structures to them. Uh, here's Comet McNaught. Again, you can sort of see a feathery tail here. Uh, one of the things you can see in this picture, we have this fuzzy patch uh, sort of a uh, 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 right center and this, this other fuzzy patch at the top. That's the large and the small Magellanic clouds. So even if it didn't tell us this is Argentina, uh, we would be able to tell this is an, an image from the Southern Hemisphere because these two nearby galaxies are not in fact visible to us up here in North America uh, in, in our, our sky. This is of course the Milky Way. One of the things you might notice, this is actually cloud cover on the planet. And these feathery structures that we see here make it look like this is also a cloud. So for a very long time, people thought that comets were uh, outcroppings, outgassings, other kinds of things from our own planet. And it, it took a while for them to figure out that they are further and further away. In fact, it's my guy Tycho with the fake nose that I've mentioned before, who is the, the, really the first one to figure out that comets are farther away from us than the moon. And one of the ways you can do that is with our old trick parallax. If you remember all the way back to our earlier chapters, uh, if you close one eye and put your thumb up and cover something, sort of look at something in the distance and cover, cover it with your thumb and then open the other eye, you'll notice the thing jumps. That's called parallax. The further away something is, the less it jumps. Well, the moon actually jumps. If you're good enough at observation, you'll notice that the moon jumps with, with parallax. And Tycho is a very good ob observer. He could also register parallax of comets, and comets had less parallax. And that means if you have less parallax, you're further away. If you're further away from the moon, you are not inside the atmosphere. And uh, Tycho figured that out. But let's look at asteroids first. Uh, notice our size down here, 5K. If you've ever run a 5K race, you know uh, if you're in shape, it's not that long. If you're out of shape like me, it's like, <sighs> takes forever. But, uh, but no, this, you, you could do a marathon on this in no time at all. You could just jump, 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 because there's no gravity, and you'd need to do that because there's also no atmosphere. 
Uh, when I say no gravity, I mean there's microgravity. There, there, you, could, you could do uh, sort of leap tall buildings in a single bound on this. It would hold you, but it wouldn't hold you the way you, you would weigh almost nothing on this. But these are very small. Uh, there are 150,000 different ones on, in, in our catalogs. That number is probably higher now because it actually goes up every single day. Uh, this is one of the areas that amateur astronomers continue to be prominent in, is locating and identifying new asteroids with their regular telescopes, because these are nearby objects quite frequently, so they can actually be seen with our regular telescopes. The largest one is Ceres, and Ceres is just a little smaller than the state of Texas. Uh, so, so if you sort of imagine Texas, uh, you have the sort of the, the panhandle at the top, you have uh, Corpus Christi and everything down at the bottom. I think it's Brownsburg that's at, at the border down there. It would actually, Ceres would be less than that distance there. If you think of El Paso on one side, Texarkana on the other, again, Ceres would be less than that distance. Uh, Ceres is the only one out of all of these asteroids that is spherical. Vesta is almost spherical, that's the second largest one. Uh, but we also consider Ceres, in addition to being an asteroid, as a dwarf planet, sort of like Pluto. Here we can see on the side, over here on the right-hand side, uh, we, we have Vesta, that's just a little slice of Vesta. Vesta is probably uh, maybe about the size of New Mexico, maybe a little bit larger uh, than, than that state. So much smaller than Ceres, but much larger than many of these others. Uh, we have Ida and Dactyl here, they're actually a pair. Uh, we have, have uh, Steins. Uh, Steins is probably about the size of Ellettsville. Ida is probably about the size of Monroe County. Uh, so, so these are, are relatively small. The thing in parentheses here, the word in parentheses, actually corresponds to a probe that has either gone to or near one of these asteroids. So we've been to quite a number of them. Notice that asteroids are not round. They're potato shaped, they're wedge shaped, they're odd shaped along the way. Uh, Ceres and Vesta, again, sort of, are, are, are uh, the only exceptions where they're spherical. Notice they're also heavily cratered. There's no water on the surface, so you don't get erosion from water. There's no atmosphere, so you don't get erosion from wind. The only thing that happens on these, they don't have any sort of internal uh, lava or magma kinds of structures. So the only thing that happens to change the surface is they get impacted, they get hit. Most asteroids live between Jupiter and Mars. You can remember that from the song, fly me to the moon, let me live among the stars, something, something, something else, Jupiter and Mars. Uh, so, so most of them live between Jupiter and Mars here. Notice we have a couple of groups here called Trojans and Greeks. They are actually trailing around as Jupiter goes around. They're trailing at what we call the Lagrange points. There are certain areas where gravity typically balances out and cancels out on each other. And these are ones that are hanging out at the two Lagrange points of Jupiter as Jupiter goes around uh, the sun. Actually, I should be doing it this way. It goes counterclockwise. Uh, so, so, so we have some that are in front and some that are behind along the way. But these are ones that have been caught up from the main asteroid belt. Notice that some also cross over into the inner planets. We have some that come close to the Earth on a regular basis. Uh, so we have to watch out for that. There are three main types of asteroids. We have stony types, carbonaceous kinds, and metallic types. Notice the metallic types tend to be uh, a much lower percentage of that. The carbonation type, carbonaceous types have a higher percentage there. Uh, this is important for us to know in a couple of different ways, because if we're going to get hit by one, we'd much rather be hit by this, which is more like a bag of sand or bag of gra gravel, rather than this, which is more like an iron barbell. Uh, if I'm going to be hit in the face with anything, I'd rather it be a bag of sand than it be a barbell. Uh, so, so and, and of course, carbonaceous kinds are interesting to us because life is based on carbon. And that, that gives us uh, intriguing clues as to what may have been in the early solar system. Primitive means these are things that have been out there since the beginning of our solar system. Differentiated means something has happened to them along the way. 
uh, they've had major impacts or other kinds of stuff that's happened to them. We do have pieces of, of asteroids here on Earth. When something impacts, like it hits Vesta, it can throw up particles. There's again, not a lot of gravity to pull it back down, so they just float in the, uh, the vicinity of the asteroid until gravity pulls from different things in different ways, flings it all over the solar system, and some of them actually hit us. So this is a piece of Vesta from the second largest asteroid that's landed here on Earth. We've been up close and personal with several of these. Uh, Matilda, Gaspra, Ida here are, are ones that, uh, 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 that, that we can see. Uh, Matilda is a C-type, carbonaceous type over here. Gaspra and Ida are uh, uh, stony types. Uh, here we see Ida again with dactyl. And Ida and Dactyl, asteroids can have moons. So, so here, Dactyl is a moon of Ida. Ida is probably about the size of Monroe County, maybe a little bit uh, larger uh, in terms of length, maybe a little bit smaller in terms of, of its width. Uh, Dactyl over here, on the other hand, is probably about the size of our uh, Bloomington Ivy Tech campus, maybe just a little bit larger. But Ida, goes around dactyl, sorry, dactyl goes around Ida. Uh, so this is dactyl, this is Ida. Uh, uh, and, and the reason why is because even though there's virtually no gravity, there is in fact a tiny bit of gravity and there's nothing else pulling on it because there's nothing close by. So as long as there's nothing close by to pull dactyl away, it will be in orbit of Ida. We do have uh, some Asteroids that are, as I mentioned, uh, moons like Dactyl. We do have asteroids that are uh, uh, dwarf planets like Ceres. Vesta is sort of being debated as to whether it should be a dwarf planet. But we also have asteroids that are moons of planets. Uh, these two moons, Phobos and Deimos, are around Mars. You can see the coloration that we have here uh, may be coating of material from volcanic ash and dust that's been kicked up from Mars in the past. Uh, so we believe that these are captured asteroids. Most astronomers believe that. There are a couple who have a couple of other theories, uh, but, but the primary thought is these are captured asteroids because as you remember from our view of where asteroids live, See, they're between Jupiter and Mars. There are quite a number that are close to Mars. And if you get close enough to a planet, you can actually get captured by that planet. Here is Eros. Eros is one of the more oddly shaped ones. It sort of looks like almost like a saddle uh, that we're sitting here. Uh, it has a big, big crater on the top. It has a couple of other larger craters along the way. Uh, so so uh, one of the things that we see with this is that it, in fact, may have been two different asteroids that crashed together and became fused together along the way. This is asteroid Itakawa. It sort of looks like it has some kind of, of, of pox, like smallpox or something. Uh, but this, in fact, is rock and ice chunks. Uh, some asteroids are far enough out, they're outside the frost zone where they don't melt everything, and they've kept some frozen stuff on the surface here. Uh, part of the reason why this is named Itakawa is because JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, is the one that explored it. It explored uh, different kinds of, uh, the Japanese Space Agency has explored different kinds of bodies out there. Uh, one of their more spectacular uh, missions was the Hayabusa, and the Hayabusa actually went through the, the territory of asteroids and, and, uh, uh, and comets and scooped up some debris and brought it home. So here we have our little uh, return capsule separating out from the main body, which was breaking up as it was entering, entering our atmosphere. Here's Ceres and Vesta. Now, don't be misled by the picture here, uh, because one of the things, uh, let's see, I want to draw something, so maybe if I can get the tools to draw, uh, that would be lovely. These are uh, two different sizes. So if this was the size of Ceres here, this would be about the size of Vesta. 
these pictures make them look like they're the same size. But in fact, it's just because of the way they're framed in the photos. Vesta is significantly smaller than Ceres. Again, Ceres is about the size of Texas. So if we were to draw Texas here, my superior map making skills, uh, this is Ceres on top of Texas. Vesta again, much smaller. Vesta is not quite spherical, as you can see here, whereas Ceres is. And that's why it is uh, not yet accepted by everyone as a dwarf planet. Uh, but we've been up close and personal with both of these with the Dawn spacecraft. And this is an important spacecraft because this is the first one that went to a place, Vesta, went around that place several times and then broke away from that place and went and went into orbit of something else. We've never done that before. We've had some probes that have gone by one place and then gone by another place. So they visited more than one place, but they didn't stop and go into orbit and then leave. The Dawn spacecraft is the first one that went into orbit somewhere, then left that orbit and went into orbit somewhere else. That's important for us to be able to do if we're actually going to explore and not always have a one-way trip wherever we're going or a one-shot deal. One of the things that's interesting about all of this is when we got up close to Vesta, we saw major, major mountains. In fact, one of the tallest mountains in the solar system is a central peak in one of the major craters that we have here. Of course, there's no gravity to pull it down, so it can build up higher. And then we have this silver spot here, or this white spot here on uh, uh, Ceres. And what we noticed here, at first people thought it might be snow, might be ice. Uh, there were, of course, uh, internet conspiracy theories that it's a, an alien base or something like that. Uh, the truth is it seems to be salt and metallic deposits from, an, again, a major impact, as you can see right in the middle of a big crater here, that uncovered the stuff that's underneath. We do have impacts on Earth that give us our debris, like the fragment from Vesta. Something hit Vesta, kicked up the debris. Some of it landed on Earth. Sometimes they hit us and create quite a bit of devastation. They often will hit us near polar regions, just the way things cycle in. We're much more likely to be hit in Siberia or Antarctica or other places like that. The Chelyabinsk meteor uh, shattered windows and created sonic booms all over. Uh, Siberia uh, as it was burning up and coming in. The Tunguska impact site uh, we'll talk a little bit about more as well, but that uh, flattened trees for hundreds of miles all around. These are near-Earth asteroids. Uh, some of them are very small, fortunately. The ones that hit us are typically tend to be rather small, and there aren't that many that are large. Uh, this is one kilometer is a little over half a mile in large, we pretty much know where all of those are because they're easy to spot. We keep finding more and more of the smaller ones along the way. And one of the things that happens when we do is we try to map out its trajectory. I'm going to post a video up of a couple of different uh, missions to uh, different asteroids that are out there, and one of which will sort of show you the tumbling effect. Because when we're looking at these things, they're not round. So instead of just sort of orbiting in the way, they're actually tumbling in, in weird ways. And that makes their trajectory, where they're going, uncertain to us. That's why if you ever see a news report where it says we have a 30% chance or a 50% chance or a 10% chance of being hit by something, it's because we don't know whether it's going to go, if, it's, if it were spherical, we could see it's going this way, but if it's tumbling, it could go this way, or it could go this way, or it could go this way. So, so we know it's not going to go this way, but we have this sort of range. And when we have this range, we can tell what a percentage is, whether it's likely to hit us or not. Most asteroids, though, are safely between Jupiter and Mars, and most of them are in groups. Because, of course, Jupiter is pulling with its gravity in one direction, Mars is pulling with its gravity in the other direction. And as that does, as that happens, it creates these areas where they cluster together, and it creates areas where they clump. And that means there are areas between them that are empty. Those gaps were first 
mapped out by a guy named Kirkwood. Hey, here in Bloomington, we have Kirkwood Avenue, Kirkwood Hall, Kirkwood Observatory. This is the same guy. Uh, so, so he's the one who first worked out the mathematics of how all of this happens along the way. But again, notice many, many fewer asteroids around Jupiter, most around Mars. That would seem to be counterintuitive because we would think that we would have more around Jupiter. Jupiter has a lot more gravity than Mars. Mars is smaller than the Earth and Jupiter is 318 times larger than the Earth. Well, here's the answer to this. There used to be a lot more asteroids here and Jupiter ate them. So there was a lot of gravity around Jupiter and Jupiter pulled them in. Uh, so it hasn't quite eat, eaten all of these. They're far enough away, but it ate quite a number that were closer. And some became moons. A lot of the moons of Jupiter are captured asteroids. And in fact, some, we, when we look at the number of moons of Jupiter, we always have a little asterisk because some may still be spiraling in and some may be just hanging out before they spiral out. And then of course we have our Trojan asteroids, which I mentioned before at the Lagrange points on either side of Jupiter, again, being influenced by Jupiter's gravity. But Jupiter's gravity in particular is what kept all of these asteroids from clumping together, accreting together, here's the word accrete, and becoming a, yet another planet. According to some kinds of, of uh, mathematical theories, there should have been a planet between Mars and Jupiter. And some early astronomers wondered why isn't there one? And then when we discovered Ceres and Vesta and the other asteroids, it's like, oh, well, there is actually something in that spot. Well, asteroids can land on Earth. When they land on Earth, here are a bunch of kids about to be crushed by a big asteroid. Here, this is one of those big metallic ones. You don't want to be hit in the face with this one. This one did a lot of damage when it came in. And you can see it's sort of the shiny points up here where as it was heating through the atmosphere, uh, got superheated and polished. If it actually lands on the Earth, it's called a meteorite. If it's just streaking through the sky but doesn't leave anything behind or just what you're seeing in the sky, that's a meteor. Uh, meteorites fall on a regular basis. They sometimes hit here on Earth in different ways and uh, do some a little bit of destruction. Uh, if they do, a, if it's a really big one like the one that killed the dinosaurs, it can do a lot of destruction. But we don't get hit by those very often. Um, we've again got different types of asteroids, so we've got different types of meteorites. We have our primitive ones. These are the ones that come from when the solar system first formed. Uh, two different types of those primarily, stony and carbonaceous. And then we have our processed ones. Those Something's happened to these along the way. See, notice this cross hatching here. Something's happened to that as, 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 it, as it's worked its way through. This rocky one over here, notice it looks like it's been fired in a kiln. So something's happened volcanically uh, to that along the way. We have had some rocks from the moon. If something hits the moon and we can see the moon has lots and lots of craters, sometimes we'll throw up debris that will land on Earth. We have some Mars rocks that have come to us in the same way. Uh, these are the easier way to acquire moon rocks and Mars rocks than actually going there. Not a lot of cometary debris because comets, unlike asteroids, are mostly snowballs. So they're going to melt. Uh, the number one comet in terms of human history is probably Comet Haley or Halley. Uh, I've heard it pronounced both ways by people I respect and know, so either way is good. I'm going to post up another video on uh, Comet Haley here uh, for you to watch, and in fact, so that I remember uh, to do that, uh, I'm going to write it down here, video, because I now remember I also put the asteroid video that I want to show up. Uh, put up for you. So asteroid and Halley's Comet. What I'm going to do is uh, we, we, we had a video on the Rosetta mission which went to a different comet and there was a portion of that video that talks about Comet Halley as well along the way. But comets can in fact be periodic which means they come back again and again and again. Halley's Comet is the most famous of that because of Edmund Halley here. And he's the first one who figured out that this comet is something we've seen before and we'll see again. And he traced it back using different sightings, including what's called the Bayou Tapestry. And the Bayou Tapestry is this 
thing that was done in commemoration of William the Conqueror's conquest of England in the year 1066. And shortly after the year 1066, there was this big tapestry that was made, sort of embroidery and everything else. And it's sort of like a comic strip where you have a scene and a scene and a scene uh, from this. Well, in one of the scenes, there was a throne. And there was a guy sitting on the throne. Let's throw a little crown on his head here, uh, named King Harold. And King Harold was sitting on the throne looking rather sad. And not a big surprise because the next day, a few panels later here, uh, he goes out and gets an arrow through the eye and dies. Uh, well, above him, they have stitched something like this, a comet. There was a comet in 1066 that was going over. And he was looking up at the comet and said, <clears throat> that's not good for me. Uh, so, so, but Edmund Haley here was able to figure out that that was one of the instances where that same comet, now called Haley's Comet, would come again and again and again. So, so what we have are some that return over and over again. There are some that are one time only, and there are some that take so long to come back that we don't really ever get to see them again. Uh, but, but when they do get close to us, they will start to glow because they're melting in the sunshine and they'll grow a tail. And those are called sun grazing comets when that happens. Most comets never make it in. Most comets do not have tails. Most of them are always out in the solar system. Only the ones that come in are sun grazing comets and they will grow a tail sometimes longer than the distance between the earth and the sun. Remember that's one AU. So you can have a hundred million mile long tail. But mostly they're dirty snowballs. They've got sort of carbon stuff on the outside, so they're, they're dark. Uh, this is a close-up of Comet Wild. This is rather small, smaller than Bloomington, but notice the glow area here, which is called the coma. Uh, coma, it means cloud and hazy, so if you're in a coma, you're, you're sort of out, you're in, a, in your own cloud here. Uh, this can grow to be larger than the Earth. Here we can see a mission that was sent up to Comet Temple 1 in 2005. We actually impacted something on the surface. Notice how dark this surface is. We tend to think, it's like they'd say, don't eat the yellow snow. You definitely don't want to eat the snow uh, on, on this. But this was mission deep in impact, and we actually sent a missile up so that we could see what was underneath the coating that was here along the way. Here is a close-up of a comet that is coming in towards the sun. You can see it's melting, but it doesn't melt evenly. It's not just an even glow. You have these fissures and geysers and other things that are spewing, and that causes it to tumble, which again is why sometimes they'll tumble into the sun and sometimes tumble away. But as this begins to melt, we have some dust and debris from that dark stuff that is on the top, and we have our plasma tail energy that's both being blown off by the sun so the tails are always pointing away from the sun. So if it's going towards the sun here, the comet's motion goes around the sun. So, so if we were to uh, sort of think about the orbit here, let's say the sun is here, the comet's going to go in this direction here. Uh, notice the ion tail, the energy tail, is always pointing away from the sun. So when the comet's over here, the tail's going to be like this. The dust tail is mostly pointing away from the sun, but the sun has a solar wind that's blowing, and it's blowing the tail off a little bit off center uh, from, from that. So, so that happens on all comets. Here's a fragment. Uh, from a comet that was brought back to us. Again, uh, we've had our, our sort of debris return, our sample return missions. And here's a close-up of Halley's Comet. It looks like, I mean, from, from the way we tend to think of rockets and spaceships and other things, we would think it's going in this direction. But in truth, what is happening is the sun is going to be over here. Can I have my things so that I can draw? Sometimes this doesn't want to operate. The sun is actually over here. So while we might think it's jetting away this way, in fact, it's going this way. The reason we know that is this is the side that's on this by the sun. This is the side that's melting. 
So the thing itself is going around the sun here and it's tumbling, it's tumbling around. If I could read map zoom, I would do that because it takes too long sometimes. Here's another image of Halley's Comet and you can see the ion tail and you can see the dust tail separating out there. It came by in 1986. Uh, before then it had been here in 1910, 1911. Uh, again it was here in 1066. It sort of comes and comes and comes. It came in the year Mark Twain was born. It came in the year Mark Twain was died, uh, the year Mark Twain died. He said he planned it that way. Uh, it's rather interesting. Here we can see the comet sort of going around. And as it's out here, it's far enough away from the sun, it stays frozen. But as it gets closer and closer and closer to the sun, the tail grows and grows, always pointing away from the sun. So even when it's going back in this direction, it's now flying into its tail. As we look here, we can see mostly Halley's Comet will live out here where it stays frozen. Then for about six months or so out of that 75, 76 year cycle, it will come in towards the sun. It will begin to glow about a little bit inside of Jupiter's orbit. Uh, so between Jupiter and Mars, it will begin to glow. It will begin to grow a tail as it gets closer and closer and closer to the sun. By the time it's near us, its tail will be very prominent. By the time it's on the other side of the sun, the tail will be very, very strong. And then when it goes past the sun, the tail begins to dissipate until we get back out here. Eventually, comets run out of fuel. They run out of stuff to melt. And sometimes they tumble into the sun along the way. Uh, here we have hale -Bopp. Again, we can see the two tails very prominent. Uh, here we have comet Imarcos. Uh, and we can sort of see it has two tails as well. This tail is much more fragmentary uh, along the way. When they leave stuff behind as they're going through the tails, they leave a trail of debris. When we go through that debris, we get meteor showers. And we have one meteor shower happening this week as I'm recording this, the Leonid meteor shower. Meteor showers always seem to come from the same spot in the sky because as we're going through, the, the sky, it looks sort of, they all seem to be coming from there. They're not actually coming from those spots. They're coming from a place in front of what we're seeing. But we call like the Leonids, it looks like they're coming from Leo, although Leo, the stars in Leo are much, much, much further away. Uh, we have been up close and personal, and this is one of the videos that I just wrote down that I will post up for you. The Rosetta mission went into orbit of this uh, comet. It's called Comet cherimov germasinko which no one can pronounce, so we say 67P. Uh, it actually had a lander named Philae, and Philae landed on the, ast uh, on, 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 on the uh, comet. Uh, it almost said asteroid, sorry, uh, on the comet. But one of the things we didn't take into account, and this is now something that's important uh, when we land on asteroids and comets, there's almost no gravity. Again, it's almost zero gravity. It's microgravity, which means when it, something lands, we can't count on gravity to hold it down. So when it lands, it actually has enough of a bump that it bumps up. And the Philae lander actually bumped, 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 bumped into an area that was mostly shaded, as you can see here, and it didn't get solar energy. So it could only last for a number of hours rather than days or weeks, which we'd planned. Uh, but it did get a lot done while it, it was there, including this. Notice this is a view from the surface. As it was coming into the sun, this geyser begins to spew. It wasn't spewing here, now here it's melting. We can see this glow starting. The Rosetta itself was in orbit of the comet as it was beginning to glow. So these are really spectacular photos that are happening here. Uh, we have other orbits like uh, Chiron's orbit here. It takes about 50 years. It goes out, not quite out as far as Neptune or the outer solar system. Uh, it goes out as far as, as Uranus is here and it comes back in about once every 50 years. Uh, so so uh, when, it, when it comes into the, the inner solar system, uh, what, what we would consider to be the inner part of its orbit, it comes into where Saturn is, and when it goes out, it goes out to where Uranus is. 
So it never actually comes into the sun area, so it doesn't grow a tail, but it's still orbiting between these two areas here. One of the guys who figured out that there's a lot more out there is this guy named Jan Ort. And he looks like the evil scientist who, from the 1950s movies. He's like, I am looking at the earth and I'm going to destroy it, ha, 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 that kind of thing. He does, uh, and I, that, but he, he was uh, apparently a nice guy. Uh, he figured out that there may be as many as a trillion different things that are out there beyond the orbits of Neptune and Pluto. And not just in this sort of plane, this pancake area where the planets are, but everywhere around us. And we call that whole area of frozen snowballs now the Oort cloud in his honor. So we have, here's where we are inside of this. This is Neptune's orbit, sort of the largest outer planet it's there. Beyond that, we have our Kuiper belt, typical sort of comets uh, that, that, that might come in. And then way, way, way out here, we have all of the Oort cloud stuff. And notice it's everywhere. It's not just in that sort of flat area around the center. Uh, so as we sort of think about this, the Kuiper belt extends out 50 AUs. Remember, we're one AU out. Jupiter is 10, Saturn is uh, uh, Jupiter is 5, Saturn's 10, Uranus is 20, Neptune's 30. So within 50 AUs, we have maybe 100,000 comets or so, uh, not, not uh, uh, too far out. But then when we get out here to the Oort cloud, 50,000 AUs away, and we have trillion comets or more that are out there. When comets come in, if they come in close to us, again, we can have some quite spectacular views. Comets and doom. Again, we have that picture of Harold looking up from his throne going, oh no, this is bad, with the Halley's Comet above him, gets the arrow through the eye. Uh, for a lot of human history, people have, saw, have, have uh, foreseen uh, doom coming off of comets. Uh, that's largely because in some ways, they thought the heavens were perfect and unchangeable. So all the stars are always in the same spot, for example but these are different. Doesn't quite mesh with the idea that comets might be gas or, or uh, clouds or other kinds of things, because then that wouldn't be heavenly. That wouldn't be out in the uh, celestial sphere. So, but, but people have been mesmerized by them in different ways. Uh, so, so, so you might, in fact, a good final project would be to look at comets and how people have perceived them at different times. One of the premier comet hunters is this guy, David Levy. We have uh, Shoemaker Levy, which is a team of three people, a married couple and a third guy, uh, who, who were professional comet hunters. Most, however, uh, comet hunters are amateurs, as you see here. Uh, this says amateur. In fact, he's, certain, he's really professional now, but he started out as an amateur. Uh, uh, Shoemaker Levy 9 became a, a world famous comet, and that's what put these guys on the map, uh, really, apart from just being known in astronomy circles. But we keep finding more and more. If you find a comet, you get to name it after yourself. But if you find too many comets, they'll advise you to uh, ad name them after different things. And sometimes we name them after the, 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 the research project that we're using or the equipment that we're using uh, to find them. But here we see Comet Linear, uh, named for the Linear Project, and it began to fall apart. Now we have a comet out there right now that is also falling apart. Uh, our, our, our sort of so what we hoped would be the spectacular comet of May and June is actually beginning to crumble. And, and if you're in our astronomy club uh, here in the spring of 2020, uh, I have posted up in the announcements something about that. So you might look at that. Uh, and that would be a good project as well. But the reason why Shoemaker-Levy became a famous trio for looking at comets outside of astronomy circles is because they found one that hit Jupiter. And Shoemaker-Levy 9, that means they had found as a group eight other comets before they found this one. They noticed that it was getting a little too close to Jupiter. And as it's going around the sun, it got a little too close to Jupiter and Jupiter started pulling on it in a different way. And not only did it pull on it in a different way, remember I said Jupiter ate a bunch of asteroids for lunch, it was eating this one too. And because this is mostly snowballs, it tore it apart. And each of these fragments then hit Jupiter separately. 
each of these explosions that we're seeing on the picture here are larger than the Earth. If this had hit us, we wouldn't be doing this class today. Here are a bunch of the different fragments uh, that we were able to take a picture of. And we can see we've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. And there are a couple more that aren't showing up uh, that's here. And as it hit Jupiter, in this mushroom cloud that's hitting on the uh, tops of the clouds of Jupiter, remember there's no hard surface, but even though there's not a hard surface, we're still having a major impact and explosion. This mushroom cloud is larger than the Earth. This is off of the Hubble Space Telescope. Here's an artist rendering. It was sort of hitting on the far side for most of the fragments. As you see, we've got a little volcano going here. So this would be what we would see if we were standing on the sur surface of Io. Remember, Io is the moon with the volcanic activity. Here we see the infrared, so the heat signature of these major impacts, again, larger than the Earth. This circle here, larger than the Earth. Then sometimes things hit and we don't notice until we see this scar left over. This is from about, uh, uh, 15 years later, there's another impact. Something hit it and we didn't see it. Uh, so that's an important thing to note, is that these impacts on Jupiter add to Jupiter's mass, but they also sort of protect the inner solar system as things are coming into the inner solar system. They're far more likely to hit Saturn or Jupiter in particular because they're both so large. And that actually insulates us quite a bit. We have, however, been hit by major things. The impact that killed the dinosaurs was most likely an asteroid, not a comet. It was probably a rocky and metallic one. It had a lot of iridium, and iridium is a rare earth element, but it's fairly common around the world in a very thin coating. Uh, iridium is actually something that you're all familiar with. Uh, forgive me if I get up for a moment. Because you all have one of these. This is a cell phone, yes. The reason why you don't have a mile long antenna to pick up things, uh, and you can actually have something this small, is because it's iridium. It's coated with iridium and that makes it very sensitive. Well, all over the world, all over the world, we found dinosaurs. We found dinosaurs on every continent on the Earth except Antarctica, and it's not that they weren't there, it's just we haven't dug down there. But we found them in North America, South America, Australia, Africa, Europe, Asia, some other islands as well. Everywhere we dig, there's this coating, there's this very thin layer, North America, South America, Africa, Asia, Europe, Australia, even there's an iridium layer in Antarctica. There's this layer, just a little coating, uh, like something spray painted the planet. Every dinosaur we've ever discovered has been below that. With the one exception, we still have dinosaurs with us. They're called birds. So the leftover dinosaurs that were bird-like we found above this. Anything else has always been found below. Well, what happened? What happened? We had a major impact something that was probably five, six miles across, so we're talking really big here, uh, bigger than Bloomington, hit just on the coast of Mexico. So it hit part on land and part in water. What happened when that happened is it evaporated, evaporated lots of water here and flung up huge amounts of dust and debris from here. So it was a double whammy because it was kicking up gas, kicking up dust, kicking up debris from the asteroid itself as well as from the Earth, so mushroom cloud full of debris, and then melting lots of, of anything that would have been around the area in addition to vaporizing the water. And the water helped carry everything aloft, and it really covered the entire planet. It coated the planet, planet's atmosphere for several years blocking the sun and killing off most of the plants because the sunlight couldn't reach down to keep the plants alive. Well, anything eating plants like big dinosaurs also died. They didn't die just from the impact, they mostly died from starvation. The only things that survived were things that were small enough that could scavenge off of what was left over. Some of those were birds, some of those were mammals. Uh, so so we, we, we have this huge impact here 
uh, that, that happened, but the asteroid itself had iridium in it that then spread all over the place. And as it eventually rained down and settled down, it's all over the planet. It's all over from, from this place here. And we can see that. That is not unusual because when we have a volcanic eruption, the gas and dust from the volcano will dissipate through the atmosphere and it will actually end up in most parts of the planet. If an Icelandic volcano erupts today, say Eyjafjallajökull, that, that big volcano no one could pronounce, if it erupted today, the gas and dust from that would drift around and could actually rain back down in small amounts, because it, unless it's a huge, huge impact, on North America the next year, because that happened. 2010, there was a major eruption. 2011 and 12, we were registering the ashes here in North America. It went all around the world to get to us. In the late 1700s or early 1800s, there was a summer without a summer in New York. It was snowing in July because, again, an Icelandic volcano had erupted and put enough gas and dust into the atmosphere at that time that it blocked just enough of the sun to not let it heat up the next year. This was a thousand times more eruptive power than, than one of those volcanoes along the way. And that's what really killed the dinosaurs. Over time, of course, it's on the seacoast here, this erosion wore it away, vegetation grew back up, and so now we don't even see this unless we're using radar mapping because it's covered. We've had some bigger impacts more recently. This is from Tunguska in uh, uh, Russia, in Siberia. Um, but major impacts are really rare. Extinction level events happen millions to tens of millions of years apart. Tunguska in Siberia, in 1908, we had something that was maybe half a football field across hit here. It was probably a comet. Many people think it was a comet because we don't have a major impact site. So it was probably a comet that exploded and didn't create a crater. But what happened was, if you sort of think of where Tunguska is, Here's the planet. Sorry, it's not a great sphere. Uh, if you've ever played the game Risk, Tunguska is up where Kamchatka is in a part of the Asia you can ever handle. Uh, here's where Tunguska is, sort of near the North Pole, not too far away. 5,000 miles away over here is Cambridge in England. 5,000 miles away over here is Stanford in California. They both at this time had devices. This looks like a weird kind of um, <laughs> alien now. Uh, they both had devices at this time that could register earthquakes, sort of the Richter scale kind of, kind of uh, measurements back then. Well, they measured that there was something that hit and shook the whole planet. It took them about 20 years to triangulate from their readings where this was, and when they found it, they found these trees flattened for hundreds of miles in every direction, uh, just from, from this along the way. So, so these things happen. They happen in our world. They happen on a regular basis. But most of the time, we're, we're actually being hit every day by meteorites and dust particles and other kinds of things. Uh, we actually get tons and tons of it every single day. But the big ones that hit are very rare. So if you want to follow that, go to NASA's website here. Uh, they'll, they may even recruit you into using your computer to help analyze what's likely to hit us. But again, Jupiter is much more likely to be hit than we are. As things come in from the outside, the comets in particular, they are more likely to hit these four things that have a lot more gravity than anything over here. Uh, so, so chances are good that these are protectors of us, especially from the Oort cloud kind, kinds of things that are coming in. So if we were hit over and over and over and over again, then life would find it hard to develop here on Earth. But since we have a giant protector over here named Jupiter, we have had a more stable environment. So as we're looking for life on other planets outside of our solar system, we're not just looking for Earth-like planets with water and clouds and oxygen. We're also looking for things like this. Is there something that can be useful to keep this from being hit over and over again from the outside? So all hail Jupiter. We are very fortunate to have it in our solar system where it is right now. So uh, that's it for our 
trek through the comets and asteroids. Again, I will post up a couple of other videos for you. Also, we'll be talking about a few of these things in our next chapter as well. well I'll, I'll highlight a little bit more about meteor showers, for example, uh, and a, a little bit more about meteor fragments. Uh, so so uh, some of this will carry on into our next lecture, but we ha really have two more lectures because we'll have chapter 14 where we'll talk about that. And then we will also have chapters 15 and 16, which I'll do as a combined lecture. They're both on the sun. They're all about the sun. Uh, and and uh, so I, I'll combine those. So our final week, we'll have an extra credit video. So stay tuned for that too.